bum 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 b
And there's something about walking and sticking that phone in your pocket and just forcing each other to talk, you know, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's hard, even when you're feeling vulnerable. Like so many of our creative breakthroughs, our personal breakthroughs, our breakthroughs as a couple has happened on the move, on them streets. It's hilarious when you go back to the very first episodes of Comic Book Couples Counseling, something I would not recommend anyone <laughs> do, even though I see those numbers and everyone loves returning to our Gene and Scott conversations. Maybe in our fifth year, we will actually return to Scott and Gene. Recently, we were on the Amazing Spider Talk podcast with Dan and Mark, and we were discussing the courtship of Peter Parker and Mary Jane. And after that conversation, Lisa and I were saying like, I think that's our best conversation that we've had about those characters. It's too bad that it's not in <laughs> our feed. Yeah. And I'd like to tackle Scott and Jean again, using some different stories, just so that we can update that I th that conversation that we began this podcast with. And of course, we've learned so much about yes. the power of narrative yes. and how just if you pick up any string of our lives from our timeline, totally. it's going to completely reframe our personal narrative. Yeah. And so I feel like some some people thought that I didn't give Scott a fair shake, <laughs> and they are correct. Yeah, I mean, you know, some of the most heated uh, reviews we've ever gotten on about this podcast come from those episodes. Uh, what the heck was I saying? I totally derailed myself talking about Scott and Jean and Peter Parker and Mary Jane. Uh, walks, yes. And then a pandemic happened, and then we became out Doors people. We did, and we stomped all over Reston, Virginia. But to your point, in stomping all over Reston, Virginia, it's amazing how th that opportunity away from our domicile, away from our phones, away from our TV, and it, it just it sharpened this podcast. Like I really attribute our walks to sharpening and um, what's the word? What's the word? Like honing mm. what we do. But they're also something that we've gotten away from, which is why it is important to celebrate these arbitrary numeral hey, anniversaries. Yeah, Be you got us there. Yeah, because so, it, it makes you look back and reflect. As our podcast is getting more visible and it's getting bigger and more expectations are put on it, sometimes I feel this sense of urgency where I go like, I don't have time to have that walk. I don't have time to really sit and think because I have to grind out an episode, which is not like, I don't want you to think like, we're really, you know, we're really working hard over here. Like well, we're not ditching, we're, di we're digging not, ditches. We're not working hard either, Lisa. Don't sell yourself short. We, we, we put a lot of effort into this conversation. Many hours are gonna end up uh, not recorded to make up this short little yeah, episode. We, and it's actually probably not gonna be a short episode. <laughs> Warning you now, we pour our hearts into every single episode, but like, I have to remember that not doing and going for that walk and kind of spitballing with you, like what's in my mind, what I really wanna talk about, like all of that planning time that feels less active is part of the process. And it's also kind of what part, it's also part of what makes it fun for us. Yeah, totally, yes. So starting episode 201, more walks. And before we move into the meat of this episode, I do also want to take a moment and thank all of you listening. Mm. You know, five years ago when we started this podcast, we would not have imagined that we would have the audience that we do today. And we are eternally grateful to you. And we are chuffed that every single person, every single one of you that we've met in person or on the internet, in the virtual space, has been so cool and so kind and so nice. I really feel like we have found a little safe corner of the internet to talk about what we love and what's important to us. Yeah, I mean, it's been a rough batch of years for everybody, yeah. right? And who knows what would have happened, what my life would be like without this podcast and without this community that we have built around it. We have met several of you in person. We have met many of you online and you bring joy to us every time. And dude, if you have not reached out and said hello on the internet or in person, 
we see you too. We see your number. We did, we see the number that represents not you as a whole, but the, that represents that you're there for us. And it, it really warms our hearts. And your ears on this podcast have allowed this podcast to grow. And we've had an amazing 200 episodes. And I think we're going to have an even more amazing 400 episodes, 500 episodes, 1,000 episodes. Today's episode also marks a huge milestone for comic book couples counseling besides just getting to 200 episodes. Starting today, we are launching a partnership with the digital comics app Omnibus. For the last couple of years, we've had sponsors reach out to us and say like, hey, let's let's partner up. Let's let's help each other out. And, you know, we've we've pretty much said no to every. Well, no, not pretty much. We've said no to everybody. You know, like jewelry is not our thing. Energy drinks are not our thing. Like if we're going to go into partnership with somebody, if we're going to have a sponsor of Comic Book Couples Counseling, we want it to be something that is like philosophically aligned with us. Something that can fold into the show and make the show better as opposed to derail our message, which is to get out the um, beauty that is the medium of comics. Right. Omnibus. The good folks over at Omnibus, shout out to Travis and Kenny. They are creating a digital space that's a lot like your local comic book shop. You go to them, you browse through the shelves, you scroll through the publishers, and you find a comic that looks cool to you, and you pick it up, you buy it, and you read it. Outside of Omnibus, finding comics is more of a hard target search. Like, you type in something... And then it feeds you exactly what you're looking for and maybe like 17 other things that aren't even like related. With Omnibus, the idea is it's like going into a bookstore. You're going to find what you want to find, but you're also going to see 10 other things that interest you. It is more browsable. It's more friendly. And to me... Just more comfy and wumpy. And they've already partnered with a bunch of really rad publishers. Dark Horse Comics, Image Comics. Oni, Vault. Silver Sprocket. There is so much cool stuff over there ready to be discovered, along with the books that you're probably already reading anyway. Now, what does it mean for Omnibus to sponsor comic book couples counseling? It's not going to be like there's going to suddenly be an ad break in the middle of the show. We wanted to incorporate what was cool about Omnibus into what we do here at Comic Book Couples Counseling. So what they're sponsoring is a new segment that we're referring to, we're referring to as referrals. So if you like what we're talking about thematically with Light Carries On, with Leon and Cody, we're going to give you other books on that same sort of topic, same sort of theme. Wavelength. Yeah. Yeah. But we're not going to do that now. We're going to do that in the middle of the show where the words of affirmation used to be. But we're also not getting rid of the words of affirmation. The words of affirmation are crucial to comic book couples counseling. Those are going to come after our main topic, after the main discussion. Yeah. So, uh, sorry. We're going to program on the microphone Uh for a second. I know. We love to do this. I imagine that the words of affirmation are going to go after our reflection. Yes, yes. yes. So After yeah. our reflection, before our next week, before our outro. Yeah, because I feel like it's going to kind of reset. We've been really um, introspective and taking lessons away. I think it's going to put a nice button on the end of our counseling session. And this support from Omnibus is also going to allow us to do a lot more. We'll devote more time to the podcast ourselves, and we'll be able to increase our coverage, going to more comic book conventions, talking to more people. Uh, It's just, it's really exciting. And I just genuinely think that readers are looking for something like Omnibus. I think there is a demand and there is a hunger for what Omnibus is providing. One of the things I love about comics is that they've always commanded their own space. And I feel like Omnibus is just another cool clubhouse where we can all hang out and read and trade our comics. Yeah, and they are growing, right? Yeah. And there's a lot of potential to that space that they are building with this app. So head to those show notes, click on the link, and browse Omnibus and see what they've got going on. All righty. Leon and Cody are in the waiting room. They're actually really enjoying their time 
They are listening to My Chemical Romance and sharing one pair of earbuds. How cute can you be? Super cute. But we got to get into their counseling session. Yes, we are reading Light Carries On. It's written, illustrated, lettered, and colored by Ray Nadine. Dark Horse Comics is the publisher, as we've already stated. It's edited by Connor Knudsen, designed by Mei Hijikuro, and Josie Weaver is the digital art technician. Here is the plot taken from the Dark Horse Comics website. When Leon's camera unexpectedly breaks, he is forced to borrow a used one from his mom's antique store. As he snaps the first picture, the ghost of the camera's former owner is released, and the two are inexplicably linked. After taking Leon's body for an accidental joyride, the ghost introduces himself as Cody, a queer punk rocker who died decades ago. Of course, he doesn't remember how he wound up dead, but the two decide investigating might be the only way to end the haunting. Ray Nadine is a Chicago-based cartoonist. According to their website, manga and webcomics were their primary influence growing up in central Illinois. Ray's been making comics since 2013, focusing on themes of trauma, grief, toxic relationships, queer joy, and healing, all of which are represented in Light Carries On. Their previous work with Paul Tobin, Messenger, was published by Webtoon, and their next book, Station 6, is on its way from Oni Press. Light Carries On came out earlier this year in May. Reviews were immediately strong, including one from our very own Lisa, which you can read over at Women Write About Comics, link in the show notes. Yay. Its original working title, Lisa, was actually Dead! Exclamation mark, named after the song of the same name name from My Chemical Romance. I have, in fact, seen My Chemical Romance live. Oh. I have marched in the Black Parade. I have not. I am jealous. Music is obviously a huge presence in Light Carries On. The comic even begins with a playlist of Cody's favorite music as collected and curated on Leon's old iPod, which they are currently listening to in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. A few titles featured are Blue Jays by Days and Days, Sleep by My Chemical Romance, Judas by Lady Gaga, Dark Days by Pup, If Winter Ends by Bright Eyes. It's kind of fun to put that playlist together on your phone and listen to it while reading light carries on. I cannot listen to music and read. No? Yeah, no. I Because especially if the music has lyrics, it's distracting. I was reading the new uh, Miles Davis book from Dave Chisholm who will be on the podcast later this month and just binging through Miles Davis's work. And I found it like, um, I, I thought it like elevated the experience. And now have I actually listened to Cody's playlist while reading Light Carries On? Not yet, but not I like yet. the idea. Maybe listening to music not on the first go around, Lisa, but on the second go around after you've absorbed the story a little bit. I'll give it a go. I don't think you will, Lisa. I won't. I think it's because I'm a musician. Like, music is always, like, in the foreground for me, so I can't, like... Yeah, it's just not background. There's no such thing as background music. <laughs> fair, fair, fair. In an interview with the Gay League, Ray Nadine stated that the central characters from Light Carries On originally came from a completely different story they were working on. A modern fantasy story, but the world building got away from Ray and they eventually scrapped it. They were then asked to pitch a romantic murder mystery and rather than starting from scratch, Ray Nadine went back to these characters that they had grown so fond of. Ray also says in that interview that they just feel like they're better suited for smaller scale, character-driven pieces, and that was something that Light Carries On helped sharpen in their mind. Ray Nadine jokes that their mission is to make their readers cry at the same places where they were crying when creating the comic. Mission accomplished, Lisa? Yeah. Same. I mean, same. This is a gut-wrenching story, but at the same time, it's not miserable. It's an incredibly hopeful story, and I am so grateful for that. Now, before we get into the thick of it with this comic, we got to look at our love expert for today's episode. After all, we're not experts ourselves, unless you count our expertise in loving each other. So we got to reach out for a little guidance. Lisa, who are we asking for help this week? Our love expert for Leanne and Cody is Dr. Terry Singh, using his TED Talk from TEDxYYC 2014, entitled, How to Get Unstuck. Brad, do you know what YYC stands for? I sure don't. It's Calgary, Canada. Oh, okay, cool. I had to Google that. 
When approaching Leon and Cody's relationship, I really considered where they were at the beginning of this book. Leon is feeling really unsatisfied with his course in life. His photography career is really unfulfilling. His love life has petered out. And he seems to be keeping his only familial connection, his mom, at arm's length. He strikes me as being both directionless and uninspired. And Cody is haunting a flipping camera. Both of these dudes are stuck. So I went to the Googs and I typed in how to get unstuck, TED Talk, and found Dr. Terry Singh. There are actually a bunch of stuck, unstuck TED Talks. Getting unstuck from grief, entrepreneurial plateaus, negative thoughts. But Dr. Singh's talk stood out to me because it was the broadest definition of stuck, like any kind of stuck, like maybe even being stuck between the realms of living and unliving stuck. <laughs> yes. Dr. Terry Singh is a registered psychologist in Calgary, Canada, who practices both clinical and forensic psychology. In his TED Talk, he mostly focuses on clinical psychology, but I thought that since... Uh, we're going to be solving the mystery of Cody's death. His forensic psychology should be underscored. In his clinical practice, according to his personal statement attached to his verification on psychology today, he uses a tailored approach to his patients, drawing upon a number of evidence-based approaches, including emotion-focused therapy, psychodynamic therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, experiential therapy, motivational interviewing, and solution-focused therapy. To Dr. Terry Singh, the feeling of being stuck is feeling like we're at the mercy of a problem that has no solutions. It's a point of frustration from which there is virtually nowhere to turn. It can make a person feel uninspired. It'll cause someone to lose focus and interest in their goals and the things that they enjoy. We've all had periods of stuckness. We've all reached points where we throw up our hands and say, this must be just how it is. We may even let this stuckness become our normal and define ourselves and the world by it. In his talk, Dr. Singh gives a few strategies for getting unstuck, which I've attempted to consolidate into steps or action items for Cody and Leon. Brad, Number one kind of blew my mind. Right. Are you ready for number one? I'm always ready to have my mind blown. Number one is acknowledge that you're stuck because getting unstuck is not the same as feeling better or successfully changing. Mm, that's the part. Yeah. That's the part, right? Yeah, because uh, getting unstuck, you just mean like, getting unstuck means you're succeeding and not being stuck. Yeah, you're just moving. Right, and that's not necessarily true. Yeah, that's what Singh's saying. What, like, getting unstuck is just the first step we take towards changing. Dr. Singh is pointing to this over-prioritization of our feelings over the problem. Like, I don't like feeling this, so I'm just going to do this or that to like feel better. We treat the discomfort like it's the problem when you might actually be blind to what the problem actually mm, is. Mm, mm. Number two is take an inventory of your experience of being stuck. The quote I often see pulled from this TED Talk is, you have to arrive at a place before you can leave it. Mm. I don't know if that quote really works for me because in my brain it like mixes the metaphor. But I that mean, is something that I have heard. Mm, okay, so like to me, like if you're stuck, you can't arrive somewhere if you're stuck, like maybe if it was like, you can't leave a place until you know <laughs> so what's the logic's a little you. faulty. I see. Yeah. I, I hear it, but it's also like, it, I mean that it's a good blurb, but the action item is to really consider what the stuck feeling really feels and is like. Dr. Singh really belabors the point that you should not take shortcuts with this step. He has all of the Ted talks and attendees do this little exercise. In fact, Brad, I'm going to make you do the exercise right now. Oh, boy. And listeners can play along. Pressure. But I want you to take a moment and then describe your inventory of this moment right now. What is What does inventory mean? Like, just, like, think descriptively about the moment that you're in. Like, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? So, um, maybe, like, right now I am, ah, ooh, gosh. I am looking at the clock on this episode and thinking that I'm hungry and I haven't had lunch yet and I could I could use some lunch. Um, I'm wishing that I had actually put some pants on. 
<laughs> I'm recording in my underwear because I was hot earlier, but now I'm cold and clammy. Uh, I'm feeling a, a, a sense of contentment because I love doing this with you. But in that contentment, it's also maybe like a little stress that I want to I wanted to get I want to I want to put a good episode together. Okay, that was pretty thorough. <sighs> that was a really good description of this moment. So, um one thing you didn't consider though is like you were talking a lot about your thoughts, but what about like your behavior? So what behaviors are are you doing? Are you talking about like my fidgeting? Oh, or or um how about um do you have to pee? Do you have to pee at all? <laughs> uh no, I don't have to pee. Are you feeling any aches and pains? <laughs> well, I'm constantly feeling <laughs> aches and pains. I have arthritis. My knuckles are on fire right now. So you so what this exercise is intending to point out is that even with your very thorough description of your experience, you're still leaving out way more than what your narrative of the experience actually includes. Got it. Yeah, sure. Here's This is my <laughs> takeaway quote from Dr. Singh's TED Talk. Our experience is far richer than we give it credit for, and paying greater attention to the whole of our experience is the first step towards change. I think for me to really do this to take inventory of the moment it would not make for good podcast no, right no, like, no, no because no. I would I would really need to quiet my mind and like do a little bit of meditation and really feel myself you would have to practice it yeah yeah but I mean you it takes time right like you can't be like go do it what are you feeling like there's too much pressure for me to properly take inventory of where I am right now. Okay, maybe it worked better in the context of the TED Talk because it was not a back and forth mm. kind of thing. He was just like, think in your brain, describe this experience. And then did you consider that you have to pee? You know what I mean? Like, so maybe maybe we should cut it from the podcast. No, no, no. This is good content. Okay. Um, number three is to check your blind spots. So we all have a filter through which we see the world. Some of us are more cerebral and we think more about our thoughts and some of us are like more emotional and we think about our feelings. Some of us are more behavioral. We think about like, what did we do? And some of us are more physical, like, ooh, I feel chilly. I feel hungry, whatever. The filter through which we see the world is from a place of our strengths, right? Maybe like being more cerebral has served you your entire life, but just the very nature of having a filter creates blind spots. You can kind of check your own blind spots by trying to consider like what you might not have considered but, like, it's hard to go, like, how do you remember what you've forgotten? You know what I mean? If you've forgotten mm -hmm, it, then it's gone, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. So an even better way is to get an outside opinion. For Dr. Singh, he's mostly talking about going to see a clinical psychologist like himself, which, of course, you should. If you are experiencing debilitating stuckness that is negatively affecting your life, or you have access to therapy on a regular basis... One aha moment in this talk for me was this quote. Psychotherapy doesn't help get people unstuck because of what the therapist knows. It helps to get people unstuck because of what the person who is stuck knows. You have the answers you need. You just right. got to get to them. Yeah, Ther I definitely am a believer in that. Therapists have the tools to help us take a more thorough inventory of our experience in in order to identify what is sticking you. I think, though, for smaller areas of stuckness, talking to anyone, a trusted friend maybe, or a ghost, can help <laughs> you check the blind spots of your experiences because they will just have a different perspective. And even if you talk to them and go like, well, it's not like that for me. That is a point of clarity. And, and I mean, like, that's what we've always done with the podcast, right? Like when we go to comics, what we're seeking is the other perspective that'll help us get out of ourselves so that we can better understand what's going on inside ourselves. And we don't have to take the whole thing whole cloth. Mm, mm, Even if mm. the thing we learn is, oh, it turns out I don't agree with yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So number four is to have an aha moment. In your inventory, you'll hopefully strike something that you haven't considered before that holds the key to your stuckness, and you can kind of move in a direction of a solution and bada bing, bada boom, you're unstuck. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's got to be more nuanced than that, and his in his TED Talk, he has examples that are kind of hypothetical and simple to prove his point. 
But I think the more important thing to do is just to do something that kind of empowers you into believing that the stuckness is temporary. Mm. The main thrust of Dr. Terry Singh's TED Talk reminds me of something that a wise fake nun under witness protection, <laughs> played by Whoopi Goldberg, once taught me as a small child. How many times has Sister Act come up on Comic Book Couples Council? It's only this quote, and, <laughs> and I sing it all of the time, and I'm going to sing it again. Do it. If you want to be somebody... If you want to go somewhere, you got to wake up and pay attention. Sister Act 2, <laughs> cinematic masterpiece. And I'm not, uh, for vanity's sake, going to do a retake of that singing, even though I really want to. <laughs> Lovely. But the way that Terry Singh puts it is, here's a quote, increasing your awareness of the whole of your experience is quite literally preventative medicine. Mm. In his practice, he has observed profound positive effects from this seemingly small and subtle shift. Like for me in my life, for efficiency, I try to ignore a bunch of stuff. <laughs> like, like so much of me is just like, well, I'm not going to even think about that. And I'm we just going to keep barely. They have through. had an argument slash conversation while walking about that very topic. <laughs> yes. I, I like, I put my blinders on. Like, I'm just like, <laughs> it's just what I do. But I think for both Cody and Leon and myself, paying greater attention to what, we already know will help us all move in the direction of feeling less stuck and feeling more fulfilled in my personal, I, got, I went back to talking about myself, in their personal <laughs> and creative lives. And I like this. I like this. Um, yeah, I, I should probably watch this TED Talk. Link in the show notes, friends. Lisa, I'm really impressed that you found a TED Talk, that you found Dr. Singh, that to me seems like really does apply well to what's going on with Leon and Cody and Light Carries On. Why, thank you. But I do think that the feeling of being stuck with a problem and having that hot button frustration of every time I think about this thing, I just get so, so riled up. I think that that is a universal experience that we can apply too many stories. Right. So in the spirit of helping people find their next favorite book, we have reached the Omnibus Presents referrals program of comic book couples counseling we don't have a song i know i'm racking my <laughs> brain like i've got this referrals but it's not really superhero related <laughs> we're gonna have to work on like a transition tune of some kind this is new remember what i said i was going to pre-record the na 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 and we still haven't done that no, we have not and we might not ever have an actual theme for this new segment. We might just use that little referral sound you just made. Sure. I liked it. I okay, liked good. it. Referrals. But Lisa here has a comic book referral. I have a comic book referral. Both of these recommendations are currently available on the Omnibus app. And we think that they sort of extend from the themes and conversations that we're having around Ray Nadine and light carries on. Lisa, do you want to go first with your referral? Sure. For my referral, I really wanted to think about that universal feeling of stuckness. And I also wanted to find a couple like Leon and Cody where they are so contrasting that they really do help each other see their blind spots and help them get unstuck. So I, of course, chose I Hate This Place by Kyle Starks. With <laughs> a our... CBCC classic. Yes, yes. We had him on to talk about this book that I love so much. Uh, the art is by Artyom Topolin, and it's just a great read with uh, some supernatural 
alien horror stuff. At its heart, it's just a really sweet relationship comic. Not just some weird supernatural like horror stuff. Like all of the weird. <laughs> like, so much of the weird supernatural horror every stuff. Every kind of horror element is in I Hate This Place. It's a kitchen sink horror comic. And they're literally stuck at that farmhouse. Like, they literally can't leave. So for my referral, I wasn't really considering stuckness as a theme at the time, although I do think that it could very much apply to my comic book here. I was really looking for something that had a relationship at its core that had some funky supernatural vibes to it and was coming from a publisher that I wish more people were obsessed with. And this is the publisher that when I saw was on Omnibus, I was like, oh, Omnibus has got it going on. Fully on board. And that's Silver Sprocket Press, which we always go to whenever we're at like Small Press Expo mm -hmm. or New York Comic Con. They always have like the best table. And the book that I'm highlighting is Hellphone from cartoonist Benji Nate. Benji Nate also, like Ray Nadine, doing it all, writing yeah. and illustrating. And the relationship at the center of Hellphone is not necessarily a romantic one. It's two best friends, Sissy and Lola. And they, they discover a flip phone and it rings one day. They answer that phone and there's a mysterious voice on the other end and it has some instructions. And when they follow those instructions, they begin an investigation that centers around a really grisly crime. Ooh. So yes, you can see that there's like slight parallels there plot wise to what's going on in Light Carries On. Now, Benji Nate has a very different style than Ray Nadine, but both carry a savage youthfulness. Mm. You know, there there is uh, some anger in there, but it's not without its hope. They both have a punk rock sensibility. Yes. I haven't read this one, but I have read Catboy. Which is also on Omnibus, and I would also recommend. But yeah, they're both punk rock. Ray Nadine and Benji Nate are punk rock. And they're just exploring relationships in the way that we want cartoonists to explore relationships. And yeah, that's our referral segment sponsored by Omnibus. I think we nailed it, Lisa. Yeah, our first go. You you guys realize they're called referrals because we're counselors and sometimes like doctors refer people to other places for other needs. If you do continue this extracurricular activity and you read I Hate This Place or Hellphone after Devouring Light Carries On, please reach out to us and let us know what you thought of them. Were they what the doctor ordered? Ooh. Yeah, I can extend metaphors also, Lisa. I like my metaphors like I like my men. Long, Long and, and strong. strong. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I would shout. No, Lisa, I told you that you would shout. I'm just excited to be here. I'm excited to be here because it's now time to bring Leon and Cody into session and let us dig into Light Carries On by Ray Nadine. The book starts off with, I think, a really strong introduction of where Leon is mentally, emotionally, and it starts in a 7-Eleven. Well, that's where I'm prone to have a mental crisis at 7-Eleven. I think that drinking Slurpees, like, on the regular is, like a short walk to a life of frustration because the like few times that I've been tempted to have a Slurpee, all of the lights are on. Like when are the Slurpees frozen? You know? Right, 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 right. Every time I want like the, uh, what, what I'm trying to remember. So like, all right, full disclosure, I have not had a Slurpee in many a year, but Slurpees were a thing in my childhood. And I'm, I'm guessing they're a thing in a lot of people's childhood because it's just sweet frozen drink, right? Who doesn't love sweet frozen drink? But I, but when you would go and get that sweet frozen drink, your flavor, like you're saying, never seemed to be there. Like if you wanted Coca-Cola that day, Coca-Cola not available. If you wanted cherry that day, cherry not available. But I think what I was actually getting at with my glib response to your statement is that when you are doing the most mundane things, like going to 7-Eleven, those are the moments when you find yourself suddenly in a space of mental quietness. Mm. And in that like mundanity, 
uh, terror will seek in. Like, your existential dread will flare up while you're staring at the Slurpee machine. We are going on such a tangent right now, but this reminds me of one of, like, the lowest points in my life, and it was not in a 7-Eleven. It was in a Pete's, and I was working... Which is a coffee shop, for those that don't know. Right, and I was working at a school as a classroom teacher, and I was miserable. I was so sad. But every morning I would order what's called a black tie, which was cold <laughs> brew coffee with sweetened condensed milk on the bottom and cream floating on top. And I would just look forward to that drink every day. And then one day before I went to school, my last year teaching there, I taught there five years, I dropped my black tie right as I was like trying to put the lid back on and it spilled everywhere and I cried like a baby. That that black tie, that spilled black tie becomes a metaphor for everything wrong going on in your life. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what's happening to Leon in this moment where he walks up to his Slurpee machine and God damn it, Wise Cherry gotta be out. Like, yeah. I feel like he's in this low place where he feels like the world is kind of conspiring against and him. And he has a relationship with the clerk working at 7-Eleven to the point where the clerk's like, hold on, I thought you were a cherry person. And that question, right, that question to Leon just highlights like, yeah, I am a cherry person. You don't have cherry. What's going on with my life? I know. And then the person at 7-Eleven feels obligated to apologize, which I think is... Um, too much, you know, the things are chaotic. Life is chaotic. But Leon's Slurpee, you know, the, his second uh, choice Slurpee ends up having the same fate as your black tie. It collapses on the ground after a bicyclist bumps into him on the street. We did skip over something when he was talking to the 7-Eleven yeah. clerk. Um, they were asking about how his job is. He He's a photographer for weddings and he replies, money's decent, but it's kind of boring sober. So he is also like on the road to sobriety and he's not really satisfied with his work. So he's not satisfied with his Slurpee flavor. He's not satisfied with his career. He's not satisfied with his state of sobriety and the sacrifices that calls And for. that's all communicated in two pages. Yeah, there's a lot of information packed right in there, right in the beginning. And when the Slurpee goes down after the collision with the bicyclists, we get a second goddammit, because it's not just the Slurpee that goes kablooey, it's his camera. And that's his living. That's his life. So he ends up having to go to his mother's antique store to see if she has in stock a camera so he can continue doing his work. But while he's there, he is kind of distant He's smoking inside, which his mother hates, which shows like he's not thinking about his mother's feelings. And then his mother asks about the guy he's dating. And he's like, oh, yeah, we broke up like two weeks ago. And she goes like, hey, if we talked more, if we hung out more, I would know these important details of your life. Yeah, but you know that feeling of... When you're going through a rough patch, you don't want to talk to your parents because you don't want to, like, go through the laundry list of the things that aren't working right now. Yeah, I, like, because your parents sometimes perhaps take it as a reflection of their failure, perhaps. Uh, or maybe I'm, I'm projecting. <laughs> you might be projecting there, and I don't even know if that's necessarily true in your case, Lisa. But I think it is an opportunity, like, when you... When you are in a conversation with your parent and your parent wants to know like, hey, what's going on in your life? And then you do a laundry list of these are the mm -hmm. things that are no longer going on in my life. It causes you to reflect on what you think are your tiny failings. And when you reflect on your tiny failings, suddenly those tiny failings become big failings and suddenly you're like, oh, what is happening with my life? Yeah, yeah. You start taking yourself on a, a, a negative spiral. And then you start getting, you know, these messages from the outside. You know, Cherry's not available. Your camera breaks. You come home to your apartment and there's a letter from Veterans Affairs saying that your disability pension is going to be late. So you don't have money either. And and your apartment, you're alone in it. You're trapped in it. There's no other voices except maybe like a podcast you're listening to or television. But those can be such hollow friends. So when you're in your apartment alone and with all these quote unquote signs... 
you're, I mean, you get low. But it's not all doom and gloom because he did manage to get a camera from his mom in exchange for like later, like moving a couch or something. But this camera isn't a digital camera. It's a film camera, which he hasn't worked on since he was in photography school or whatever. But he still has some chemicals left over. So he's going to be able to take pictures and he's going to be able to develop them. Most importantly, though, that camera comes with something a little extra special. <laughs> a friend. A friend, a ghost. So when he's all alone in his apartment and he's lying on the bed and he's feeling super low, he starts tinkering with the camera. And when he hits click, a hand reaches out and it is Cody Back from the dead. Or I guess not back from the dead, but... Uh, yeah, back from the dead. Well, they're dead still, right? They're a ghost, so it's not back from the dead. He's not resurrected. It, 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 Cody is back in the land of the living. Yeah, That's how I'll phrase there it. There you go. <laughs> and, he, and he jumps out of that camera directly into Leon, and now Leon's possessed. Yeah, and, and now they go on an adventure together. Kind of together, because Le Leon doesn't know. Yeah, it's more of a hijacking, and Cody immediately goes into Leon's wardrobe and finds some clothes that they prefer. They have like a little fashion show. Uh, Cody also discovers that he's still in Chicago. So we get from the jump from this possession that some time has passed since Cody has died. So here's where we get a crash course in Cody's character because he doesn't like the clothes that Leon's wearing. It doesn't have enough flair for him. And he's excited at the opportunity of getting to use somebody else's money, though he's slightly disappointed that that person is also broke. <laughs> um, some might say dead broke. <laughs> um, and then the place he goes is directly to the 7-Eleven to get a Slurpee. But instead of going like, I want my one flavor, I want my cherry Slurpee, he builds what is called colloquially a suicide, where you pull a little bit from each nozzle. And the clerk is stunned and baffled by Leon's appearance and Leon's Slurpee. Like, hey, I thought you liked cherry Slurpees. And here is a little tidbit where I feel like we get Cody's entire life philosophy in one sentence. And that is describing his drink. It's like all of the flavors mixed up in one and kind of tastes like shit. But I mean, that's the fun of it anyway, where I feel like Cody is an individual who is afraid of missing out on something. So he'd rather do everything and have a bad time. Unlike Leon, who's more like, I like to be able to count on something. I can count on Cherry satisfying my need for a Slurpee. And the next chapter really lays out how that philosophy is working for him because we get an entire chapter of flashbacks. When Cody is wearing Leon's body, he goes to a punk show. He's happy to see that punk is still doing its thing. But then we go backwards in time to like the late 70s, early 80s. We see his band that Cody was a part of. We meet his best friend, Snyder. We meet his boyfriend. It's, it's complicated. complicated. Ooh, jinx. Jinx. You owe me a Slurpee. But <laughs> what I find fascinating about Light Carries On is that we get a lot of backstory for Cody the ghost. Because I guess they are the central mystery of this story. How did Cody become the ghost? But we get very little about Leon's backstory other than he was a vet, he saw some stuff, he has some PTSD as a result. And one of his strongest relationships, one of his strongest romances in his life started while he was serving overseas. But then fizzled out once they both came home. But I think that's because we're supposed to compare Cody's past to Leon's present. Yeah. Because they are both in their own form of stuckness where Cody is stuck in this relationship with Kellen that he is afraid of losing if he confronts Kellen for treating him so badly because Kellen is a gaslighting a-hole. And Leon is also putting up with a certain amount of dissatisfaction with the kind of directionless way he's living his life. I see Cody as stuck because he's afraid of losing something. And I see Leon as stuck 
because he's afraid of taking a risk that might lead to gaining something, but it also like might not. I get the impression that they recognize this in each other pretty quickly, even though it's not said until a little bit later. Leon, when he, you know, learns that, yes, there is indeed a spirit world. Ghosts can be a thing. He is so nonplussed by it. And initially, when I was reading this comic, I was like, why? Why isn't this guy a little bit more freaked out? He says to Cody that, well, I've seen stuff in my day, right? Like, like he's he's gone through the horrors of war and after experiencing Afghanistan, nothing's really going to shock him, not even a ghost. And like I buy that and I don't buy that. But I think what's most important, what really gets past, gets beyond the supernatural is how Leon really recognizes in Cody the struggles that he's going through mm. right now in the present. I also see Leon as kind of like this helpful guy and like. We are all so steeped in ghost lore. We all <laughs> we all go like, oh, there's a ghost. There's only one thing we've got to do. It's our responsibility to help this ghost yeah. move on. Something's keeping Cody here. We got to figure out what that is so that he can walk into the light like Patrick Swayze. Exactly. So he goes uh, directly into solving things mode, which means to the internet, <laughs> uh, which uh, blows Cody's mind, by the way. Yeah, we get some information through this source called Wikipedia. Uh, Cody's band does have an entry, so congrats to Cody's band for making it to those heights. The Raven Conspiracy. That does sound like a, a cool band name. And what Wikipedia tells them is that Cody killed himself, and that's why he's there, but Cody immediately rejects that. He says, there is no way I took my own life. And I do have to say that when we got to this point in the comic, and this moment sort of rhymes with the slurpy suicide concept, and so now you've had the word suicide mentioned twice in this book, and I got real nervous, but I think we can just say right now, hopefully everyone's read the comic already and knows this, but it, it's not a suicide. It is a murder. This is a murder mystery. And that's what really endeared me to this book, that this isn't, that Cody was not a sad person, even though he was back when he was alive in this really frustrated place. He really loved being alive. Like he wasn't certain that he was doing it right, but he wanted to live. This is a story about a queer person having a nearly impossible existence and still wanting to live. Right. I mean, the comic takes you down a path that you've seen other YA stories take you down. And then you it just plunges you into misery. And at no point are you drowning in sadness with light carries on. And even it treads down the path of ghost stories and then... It throws this huge left turn at the very end that's just like, I like I have literally never seen it in a ghost story. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think I have either. And, and it, I mean, honestly, it's the ending that really sells the book for me. Mm -hmm, same, same. It really hurts Cody's feelings to see this article on this newfangled thing called the internet misremember him. Yeah. Because I know this is jumping way ahead to the end of the book, but the book ends with this scene of Cody and Snyder sitting on a roof and kind of musing what death means to each of them. And Snyder is like a dead over, like you die, your worm food. But Cody holds on to this idea that his mother gave to him that as long as somebody on earth remembers you, as long as somebody who's alive remembers you and loves you, you're still you're you're still alive. You're still you existing. Exist. You Your exist. life is still continuing. And so for him to then confront the internet and the internet says this lie. Right. I mean, right. it's brutal. Right. And I I mean, even when he was possessing Leon and he was going to that punk show, he he was looking around, going like, nobody in this room is thinking of me. No no one in this room is is um is seeing me because I'm a ghost, but also like he, I think that he has that kind of Enneagram for individualists in him where he likes to be seen as this 
unique and interesting character. And I think, and who doesn't? Yeah, exactly. I think everybody at some point considers their legacy, right? And and you know, we're so often bombarded by historical and pop cultural legacies and we know that we will never rise in the ranks of some of those icons. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean like what does that mean for my worth? What is Brad's legacy? What is Lisa's legacy? And sometimes you answer that with, well, my children, you know, the, our families will continue on and our legacy will be in them. But for Brad and Lisa, that's not the case. <laughs> we don't have kids. So what is our legacy? Like, how, and, and like, does it really bother us to consider if no one will remember us in a hundred years or 200 years? And, um, some days it does bother me, and some yeah. days it doesn't. And sometimes I think dead over, and sometimes I think we're going to continue to exist in some other like capacity. I think that's one of the beautiful things about life is that it's so interesting and curious, and you'll never have. Well, all that's the also answers. one of the most interesting things about ghost stories, right? Like we've read and watched hundreds of them and you pick and choose what you like to formulate your own possible ghost story. Yeah. I think that's another thing that you always do after you read a book like this is you go like, okay, so when I die and let's say I do come back as a ghost, these are the rules that I want there to be. (laughs) Yeah. Leon, on the other hand, is a guy who does not want to be known so completely with all of the details. And we learn this when they go into the dark room to develop the film that Cody had left in the camera when he was still alive. Right, right. And we see a little bit of that also in the conversation that he had with his mother. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah. He does, you know, he, I don't want to be known. He likes I, to keep the details to himself. Yeah, and, and sometimes he doesn't even want to know himself. Exactly. Right? He doesn't want to confront that stuff. So they're developing the pictures And Cody just goes like, you know, how do you start getting into photography? Leon mentions, oh, after I came out of the army, I wanted to go back to school for something. And I did photography in high school. Cody, being a punk rock guy, was like, you know, you were a military guy? Ew. And Leon goes like, you know, things have changed a lot since you were alive. I am a poor kid of color. There was no way that I was going to be able to make any kind of income any other way. And don't judge me. And why are you asking so many questions? Like, that's <laughs> yeah. essentially how the, the conversation goes. But Cody, on the other hand, doesn't mind the conversation turning back to him. And who are the people in these pictures? Oh, they're my bandmates. And that was the guy I was dating. He was kind of an a-hole. That's, my, that's you know, this is the basis. Like, um, Cody loves having the light shined on him where Leon kind of uh, shuts down. But that's what makes them a good couple, right? There's just enough difference between the two of them to encourage self-reflection, right? To get a new perspective and to uh, approach themselves from that new point of view. Yeah, and they also have these kinds of uncanny ways of relating. Like, they're both queer, but from, like, radically different times or... They're both punks, but one is more of an observer and one is more of a participant. Or, like, they both have had the experience of returning back home after this reality-altering experience. Cody died decades ago. And Leon went to Afghanistan and had his entire reality broken open. So they find these ways of... It's like... They're looking at each other th- over this vast cavern, but still seeing each other in the same place. And so as you're progressing towards the end of this story, and you're going like, oh, these two work so well together. It's too bad that one's dead and one's a ghost, right? So like we, we think as readers, because we've experienced so many different types of ghost stories, that this has to end. And that inevitability for the last third of your first read-through weighs heavily on the book, but on the second read through, knowing how it doesn't necessarily have to end between the two, the book takes on a totally different vibe. And I dig that second read through vibe. To me, there is not a lot of urgency for Leon and Cody to solve this mystery. Oh, yeah. And this book is just like 85% two really nice guys 
hanging out and getting to know each other. Yeah, it's a little bit like the first before Sunrise yes. film, the Linklater movie, right? Where it's a walk and talk, except this one, there is a murder somewhere in the middle of the story. It's so funny because when I was writing the review of this book for women write about comics, I kept on using the word comfy. Like, yeah. I find this book such a sweet place to be, which is kind of weird for, like, a punk rock murder mystery. That involves a really toxic relationship. Right. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, and, But again, I don't think the comfiness really comes in until your second go around with the book. Yeah, because you're not as worried about Cody. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So most of this book is them just, like, walking around Chicago and Cody going like, this is so different. What is this bean sculpture <laughs> for? Yeah. You know, and, and um, I've been to Chicago like one time. So I have seen like the most obvious stuff. Like I've seen the bean and the spitting, the spitting sculpture and, and they are weird. Um, but like uh, for Cody, it's um, disorienting to be in a familiar place that is entirely made over. Yeah, yeah. But while this is happening, Leon is just kind of absentmindedly taking photos of Cody, presuming, of course, like, a ghost is not going to show up in a photograph, right? Yeah, but except this ghost does, and Cody could be his photography meal ticket. Yeah, yeah, I think, like... I think it's really good for Cody to see himself in a photograph, to go like, I really do actually exist. And I think it's good for Leon to see like, if I do something, like he was taking those photos without any expectation for the outcome. Mm -hmm. And then when those photographs existed, he was like, why don't I try to put these up in a show? Yeah. I think that like he, when he's hanging out with Cody, he realizes that he's allowed to just do things that feel good. So at the end of this book, when he has the, the art show and we see Cody as the, the, the main exhibit, right? These photographs is, is what's making Leon a name in the city. And, and, and what you're saying about Cody being able to see himself in those photographs and getting to see how his image through Leon's eye is affecting the audience. I think if you're going to do a sequel to this book, you could really explore how Cody as a ghost is still very much a figure of the present mm -hmm. and could start to have more interaction with the people around him today. I really want to put a pin in Am I what, getting too far ahead? I'm what too the far ahead. sequel of this book can okay, be? Okay, okay, okay. Because okay. I also have feelings okay. about that, and okay. I am. I'm also like, I am super sparked by the end of this book. Like, it does inspire me. Okay, okay. But I want to focus for a moment on Leon and his stuckness specifically, and then we can go back and okay. talk a little bit more about Cody and his stuckness and how he can perhaps get unstuck and move on to whatever this next chapter of his death is going to be. But for the most part, since Leon is walking around with his camera and Cody is attached to the camera, Cody is just kind of following Leon through his day. So I begin to see the change when he takes Leon to his job. He's got a corporate gig. He's just uh, supposed to take some photographs for social media of this little mixer. And it's the kind of thing that at the beginning of the book, he told the 7-Eleven clerk, like, my job is boring. I have to do it sober, which is annoying. Well, he takes Cody to work, and all of a sudden, it's like this fun, chill time. Right. And he's taking Cody to his therapist and he's telling the therapist, oh, you know, I met this new guy and he has me looking at life in a different way. And then he goes to see his mom and his mom is like, oh, you got to skip in your step. And I feel like for Leon, having Cody around, observing him helps shed light on Leon's blind spots. Yes. Well, this is, again, why it's good to have another person in your life observing what you do. This is why coupling can be a superpower, right? Cody sees what 
Leon is going through. And he goes, this is pretty cool. This is rad. And maybe Leon, through Cody's perspective, recognizes that those things that he once saw as failings, tiny failings in his life, are wins, are actually tiny little wins. And I think that some of that perspective does come from gratitude for being alive. All of Cody's bandmates, through one way or another, are dead. Are gone. Are gone. Cody also lost his mother while he was alive, so he has no family left. And also, they begin to talk a little bit about the differences of being queer in the 70s versus being queer in the present. Like, it's certainly not easy to be queer in the present, but there has been progress made there. Like, Cody looks around and goes like, I cannot believe that I am seeing people like me holding hands with the people that they love. Like, I could have never done that when I was alive. And spinning out of that conversation, Cody learns that his friends Barb and Tony are still around and that they own a record store on the same street that Leon's mother owns her antique shop. And so this is a huge turning point for Cody because he sees that, like, his entire life is not evaporated. He does live on in the hearts of these two. And his photograph is on the wall and holds a prominent place on their photo wall. And I think it's crucial that he matters outside of Leon's space, yes. too. That he's not just a ghost helping Leon out, but that his life his, that his life mattered and had meaning. Yeah, and later they actually go to... Leon surprises Cody with these concert tickets, and they're concert tickets to see a Ravens Conspiracy tribute band. So even his musical legacy lives on. In this new headspace of hopefulness, it allows him to finally solve his murder. And they find the bandmate, and actually not the bandmate, but they find the musician who replaced him after his murder, Michael. And they're hoping that Michael actually knows what went down with Cody. But big emotional hurdle for Leon, Michael turns out to be the grandfather of his, that big ex of his. Yes, of course, of course. And he's also the person who got the camera to the antique store. Right? Yeah, yeah. So everything is converging as we reach the climax of Light Carries On. And I like to bring this back to Dr. Singh for a moment and how he encourages people to seek help to seek aid and what we're seeing in light carries on is like to really find satisfaction with yourself and to unstuck yourself you need the assistance of others and leon not only needs cody cody doesn't only just need leon he needs michael but to get to michael you need the mom who knows who the original owner was the original owner is leon's of course X David and David is the grandson of Michael. Yeah, like no matter how you slice it, we're all in this huge human hodgepodge together and we need each other in order to get humanity as a whole unstuck. We're all just like a bunch of gears grinding humanity forward. And the biggest hurdle to moving forward to connecting with humanity is yourself. And you see it here with Cody. Cody, now so close to getting an answer to the mystery of his death, kind of puts the brakes a little bit and needs encouragement from Leon to go forward. Yeah, because uh, Cody thinks that once he knows how he died... He's going to move on. Right, because and, he's been he's seen the same ghost stories that we've seen. And uh now that he's gotten to know Leon and he's gotten to get the second chance of not life, but existence, he doesn't want Happiness. Really, yeah. Happiness. That's right, it. Right, right. He doesn't wanna he doesn't wanna move on to some kind of mystery that he doesn't know even what it could possibly yeah, be. He's already adjusted to ghost life. Yeah. And it's fun. And he's digging it. And who wouldn't? And we haven't even really said this yet, but they have actually started to bond as a couple, as a romantic couple. There is love there between them. And some serious sexual tension, which you'd think would be impossible between a corporeal and non-corporeal being. But through some uh, experimentation, Cody has figured out how to share 
Leon's memories. The first possession was kind of against Leon's will. And Leon pretty much was just like a meat robot at right, that point. Right, right. But Leon opens himself up to being possessed. And so when Cody goes into Leon the second time, they share... A, a memory. They yeah. share one of Leon's memories. So um, Cody asks him to focus on a memory that he cherishes. And he thinks about a time that he and his dad went to the planetarium. And then all of a sudden, poof, Cody and Leon are together, both incorporeal or both, both, it's unclear, but like they're (laughs) able to like hold hands and walk around and have kind of a normal date with baby Leon and his dad, like, in the background. It's a lot. It's interesting. It's it's, It's a lot. lot. (laughs) It's a lot for us, but it's also a lot for Leon and Cody because this is the first time that they almost kiss. Right. But, unfortunately, you know, that bubbly kiss energy kind of breaks the spell and they're back in their same predicament back in Leon's apartment, unable to touch. But then after that point, we see them kind of like intertwining fingers, right? And and um, Leon even mentions that Cody is like cool to the touch, which I think in like a, you know, uh, a hot, summery, uh, humidity environment has got to feel really I nice. Was, I was thinking <laughs> it was like a little bit of a Bella Edwards situation. Like, ooh, ooh so chilly. frozen. <laughs> Uh, Yeah, so they are now equipped emotionally to confront the murder of Cody. And the weird thing about this book a little bit is that we know it's a murder halfway through the comic. The reader knows it's a murder because we get to see through flashback Kellen strangle Cody. But Cody doesn't have access to that flashback the way that we do. And I guess why you structure the narrative this way is because it does create in us, the reader a dread that Cody is already feeling when he goes to Michael to see if Michael knows what happened to him. I think an extra layer of tragedy is added to Cody's death when you look at it from the perspective of stuckness because Kellen murders Cody for finally breaking up with him. So they had been in this relationship where it was ambiguous whether they should be committed to each other, well, whether Cody they were exclusive. Well, Cody seemed like th- th- we, are, we are committed to each other, but all the signals that he was getting from Kellen was that, no, we are not. Kellen was playing around with other people. Kellen was flagging. He was sending signals that he was open to sex with strangers. But then once Cody takes some initiative and says... Like Fine, this, yeah. you obviously don't love me. This is over. Kellen then lashes out and kills Cody. Exactly. So, like, one of the questions that Cody asks himself at the beginning of this book when he is having, he's taking Leon's body for a joyride was like, was I such a bad person that I deserved to die? We have gotten to know Cody. We know that even though he was this punk rock kid, He was, he helped at the grocery store and he was a a good friend when he could be. And and he was like this great person. And of course, and of course he didn't deserve to die and nobody deserves to be murdered. So we, as the reader, understand completely why he wouldn't want to move on to this ambiguous afterlife when at the moment of his death, he was at the brink of of a better actual life. He was making this really strong step towards being fulfilled and he had that stolen from him by Kellen. When he finally does get the details from Michael about his death because Michael was there, he was blackmailed by Kellen into staging his suicide. He almost immediately forgives Michael for his part in this play. But Cody also doesn't get the relief maybe he was expecting. Mm -hmm. And then he sees Leon and David in the kitchen having a really wonderful conversation. And he starts to think that, well, David and Leon really belong together. What am I doing here? There's no reason to be here. And we see him like puff away in like ghost light. Like he just disappears. And Leon is left to continue his life without Cody. 
So the reader is left with all the stages of a ghost narrative complete. This should be the end of the book, but we still have two chapters left. And neither Cody or Leon are actually, like, satisfied. I feel like at the end of a ghost movie, like, you see the person's face fade away and there's, like, this, like, serenity. Right, and that's not here in their final conversation. Like, literally, Cody is sobbing and so brokenhearted and... As he turns into that little wisp, Leon is trying to go like, Cody, don't leave me. So, like, I when I rolled into chapter nine... You're like, what the hell is this comic? What could possibly <laughs> come next? Right, right. And the next thing we see is Leon looking, looking brokenhearted, but preparing for this art show of all of these pictures of Cody. And, I, and I'm like, okay, he's reached, he's definitely unstuck. He's found the next level of his creativity, but there is now this remaining stuckness of his ghost boyfriend has left him. And I was kind of okay with that being the end of the book. I was like, oh man, this is like really bittersweet. Yeah, I, I like to me, like at this point with just a handful of pages left, I was not satisfied. I was so weirded out by this, this bittersweet, awkward ending between the two. So that when it's finally revealed that actually Cody did not move on, and that maybe there actually is a possibility of this relationship between Cody and Leon continuing as a ghost living couple. Then I was like, I'm in. I want the <laughs> sequel. Yeah, that I was like, okay, this really is a couple's session. So yeah, so like Brad said, this book ends with Cody deciding to stay. Deciding to stay with Leon and it and he it's not like he like magically like becomes corporeal like the end of beauty and the beast no. like no 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 they're just going to function this way with leon you know leon, leon being pokeable ghost. and and Co <laughs> cody just being you know a fart you know what i mean like he's nothing <laughs> he's not a fart I know, they but can they can touch i think we, we see that at the very it. end they get a kiss right Th they do make contact so the, the assumption is that the, they'll, they'll make it work together. And as I was saying earlier, because now Cody can affect the real world through photography, mm -hmm. like I feel like you can evolve that so that Cody can have more interaction with the living world. Yeah, so like this goes back to what we were talking about of we need the sequel to this book because now we have this crazy romantic odd couple of the living and so the dead. So to me, suddenly they are some characters that could show up in a BPRD comic, a yeah. Hellboy comic, right? Like this is the type of relationship that you see in Mike Mignola's work. And so you can get really funky and fun with another book. Now that book would be a totally different thing. And I don't even know if we necessarily need it because I just have fun imagining it. Right, right. But like going, so tying that last scene with Snyder that I brought up earlier in our conversation, like Cody believes that your life continues as long as you are in someone's heart. And it turns out it's going to be way more literal for him than he perhaps anticipated. It is fascinating that the final scene of this book is not between Leon and Cody, but Cody and Snyder and getting a hint of what Cody's philosophy was back in 1970, whatever, mm -hmm. and seeing how that is fulfilled in the previous chapter. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty clever way to end the comic. I, I, I totally, I, I'm totally with you on that. The thing that makes Cody and Leon staying together at the end of Light Carries On is that there are so many deaths, particularly violent deaths, where they can, there just can't be any, like, short of, like, I don't know, like, a revenge story or something. There can't really be any resolution to the end of their life. All that's left is just, like, this general sense of, like, unfairness and emptiness right like when a sudden death happens 
uh, a hollowness grows in the relationships of everyone who was who knew that person. So there's something to me that is so beautiful about reaching back to the past and drawing forward someone who did not have a chance, who did not get a shot at a fulfilled life and and say like you know what? It's improbable, but we're just going to let you and have this. That's what makes Light Carries On different than, you know, Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore, Ghost. It's not about proving to the spirit that they did good and they are deserving of their uh, eternal rest. Right, right, right. It's about giving them the life that they were robbed. Like, that's an injustice. Screw that. You're a ghost now. Let's live. And I think also looking at this from a Dr. Terry Singh getting unstuck perspective, sometimes when you have that light shown on your blind spots, you discover, oh, you're not actually stuck. This is actually your life and it's beautiful and it's fulfilling. And um, you have a right to move within it being the person that you are or with whatever limitations you perceive that you have. Like, yeah, he's a freaking ghost, but that's not actually his problem. His problem is that he wants to live. He wants to love. He wants to be with Leon. And that's not actually a problem at all. And so we reach the end of this counseling session with Leon and Cody. And I go, you guys are doing a okay. Sure. One of you is a ghost. Not a problem. We have the the utmost faith that you two are going to make it work. And you are worthy of a sequel. We are totally up for it. Now, I do have a recommendation that you will need more than just yourselves, right? Yeah. So you've now helped each other get unstuck. But I'm sure you're going to find places where you're going to get stuck again. We always fall into the cycle of stuckness. So go... Hang out with your mom. Like, yeah. don't avoid your mom. Uh, go find Bobby and Tony. Bring them into your life. Find the people. Find the helpers. You know, David could be a, an interesting wrinkle in your relationship, but don't push David away. Michael certainly needs some help, having now unburdened himself to Cody for the crime that he committed. Michael could be in your circle. Find find your circle engage with your circle and help them give you new perspective on what's going on in your own life. Yes, I love that. Build a community. Community, like if there's enough community, there are going to be no blind spots. There will always be blind spots. So, but that's our takeaway for Cody and Leon. So now we got to get into the reflections portion. What are the takeaways for Brad and Lisa? I mean, I, I, the advice I just gave Leon and Cody, I think is the advice that I should take. You know, I think there are many times where you help me get unstuck and there are times when I help you get unstuck. But when you become a couple and when you've been a couple for so long, we've been together now for 16 years, mm -hmm. five of which we've been podcasting about <laughs> couples. Uh, when you've been a couple for so long, sometimes your partner's ability to get you unstuck gets a little muddy or you don't recognize it or you take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And it's still worth it to go outside of your couple, outside of your partner to find other perspectives. I go to my parents a lot for advice. I, 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 I will unburden whatever worry I have to my dad and he'll, you know, bring his perspective. And sometimes I reject it, uh, yeah. but just in having that conversation, it brings new light to whatever problem I'm facing. Um, you know, you have friends and if you, if you don't, if you're having the same issues that you sometimes have with, uh, your partner and you, you take your partner's advice for granted, you take your dad's advice for granted, you take your friend's advice for granted. There are also professionals right, that you course. can seek and, uh, get their perspective as well. I think getting as many perspectives as possible is a good thing. That's why we go to comic books. That's why we go to stories mm -hmm. to find perspectives, to find new ways into our own problems. And sometimes the thing they say, like the perspective that you get is like, huh, I don't agree with that. And that's fine. Yeah. 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 But then consider why they don't agree with that. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, like just be open. Be curious. Yeah. Be curious. Be curious. So that's, that's my Brad Lisa takeaway. Ooh, I like it. Here's my thing that I've been kind of like noodling on 
since first watching Dr. Terry Singh's TED Talk is that, like, I'm a really sensitive person. What? And I, I know it's never come up, but like I'm like I'm a super sensitive person, and like the burden of having to be more aware and observe more and be in your stuckness more, I get overwhelmed by the feeling that I have to notice more. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I'm already noticing like so much, <laughs> and, and sometimes you're aware, like. You know, we, we go through a lot of self-help stuff. Yes. And you, we now have all the tools, <laughs> all the tools to, to fix all our problems. But just being aware of the tools doesn't necessarily mean... That you're ready to use them. Right, so that's exactly. my thing. So I have a couple of areas in my life where I definitely feel stuck. And I hit those things... And I just feel that kind of like hot frustration and rage all of the sudden. And like, I feel this urgency to like fix that stuckness right away. Like um, one of them is like, I feel like I don't get enough exercise. And the second I think like, you know, like, you know, like, I'm not getting enough exercise. Why am I stuck on that? You know, well, cause I don't feel like I don't have time and blah, 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 blah. And then I go like, I, I feel the sudden urgency for this thing that I've been putting off, but like I've been putting it off for a pretty good reason. There are these other areas of my life where I am concentrating and feeling really fulfilled by. And so like my extra tag on everything that Terry Singh said, which I think is all so valuable, it's okay to prioritize your stuckness. And like when I've, and I've just got to the place where I like, I go, like, I find that hot button piece of rage and I just go like, Hey, me, we've already agreed with ourselves that we're going to deprioritize that. Cause there's this other exciting stuff that I want to do and other important stuff that I have to do. And we just agree, me and myself, <laughs> we just agree to like, come back to that when I have time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think like Dr. Terry Singh, he specializes in like huge mental disorders. Like schizophrenia is like one of his concentrations. And I feel like, you know, that is a, that is an area of stuckness that is a huge, there is huge urgency for that. Or if you're having some kind of um, depressive episode and you need to go to the doctor, you need to go to a therapist to get help. Like that's urgent. But like, my like going like, oh, you know, you know, I, I think a walk every once in a while, that's not enough. Like that's not, that's not a reason for me to really get down on myself and get really angry at, at myself, at my stuckness. Yeah. Like it's just like, it's okay to go like, okay, you know, I do work three jobs, and you know? The other big takeaway from Dr. Singh is this idea that um, stuckness, you, because you're aware of stuckness, doesn't mean that you are going to get unstuck and just because you're not going to get immediately unstuck doesn't mean that that's a failing either. Yeah, right. 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 Yeah. That yeah. is really important. And I do forget that. Like priority one is getting unstuck. Success is like the next thing. You have to get unstuck before you can have success in that area of your life. And getting unstuck can mean failing. And we just have to be okay with that. Yeah. That's well, life. that's life. Yeah. Yeah. One failure after another, you know, getting knocked down and keep on going and all that stuff that I hear about in sports movies. <laughs> I've heard that uh, you get knocked down and you get up again and it's never going to get you down. That's what I've heard. I don't, I'm not sure if those are the lyrics, but um, you can Google them. But before you get to Googling, we got to do some words of affirmation. No, 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 no. I think I should be doing that on our Chumba first sponsored Wumba. episode, making Chumple Wumba no, references. No, no, no. So yes, words of affirmation in its new home towards the end of our conversation. For first time listeners, we should explain that the words of affirmation is our way that we give back to our new and upgrading Patreon subscribers. We curate and use these ourselves, and we're more than happy to pass them on to you. These affirmations are simple, but extremely effective in their simplicity, easy to ignore, but super powerful powerful if you choose to listen. So let's get into a more mindful state where we can observe any areas of stuckness. We're going to take a deep breath. <sighs> OK. 
Kenny. You grow and improve every day. Brandon from Apollo City Comics. You let go of all that no longer serves you. Gabriel Pagan. You have the power to create change. Andrew Isidoro. Every day is full of potential. Tim Rooney. You are capable of overcoming any challenges you face. Zach Norris. You are creative and inspired. Halen Spearing. You are in charge of your life. Sal Cataldo. You are doing your best, and that is enough. Kenneth. You are optimistic because today is a new day. Matthew Pierce. You are open to all the great things that today will bring. <sighs> yeah. It's nice to go back to like something that is like just essential. Very basic, right? Like right. basic affirmations. But to me, like those are the Stuart Smalley affirmations, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I recognize that Stuart Smalley was a skit from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> but uh, somebody I think about a lot. And when I see these affirmations, I think about Stuart Smalley and I think about that there there was power even in the comedy of Stuart Smalley. And there is definitely power in the simplicity of these affirmations. And having done it, I do think that affirmations are a great way to end an episode. Because I feel like we've made all of this progress with Leon and Cody. We've reflected on how we're going to change our lives. And like these affirmations are going to help us move forward. Yeah, I, that's exactly what I was going to say. That they're hopeful and they're forward looking, right? Yes. And so they kind of belong at the end of a conversation like we just had on Leon and Cody. And looking forward to next week. I was going to make the same <laughs> segue. Oh, you know why? Because it was an obvious thing, Lisa. I don't think we should be patting ourselves there, on the back for that segue. Hey, there's beauty and simplicity, <laughs> baby. But uh, 200 episodes in the can now. So we're on to the next 200 episodes. And episode 201 will be a creator conversation with Christian Ward talking about his new, most excellent Batman comic, City of Madness, Lisa and I have had a chance to read it already. We freaking love it. It's probably the best Batman book we've read all year. It is so good. It's, it is face-meltingly good. It's inspired by Arkham Asylum, uh, the original Grant Morrison, Dave McKean graphic novel, uh, but it becomes its own thing really quickly. And Christian Ward's art is cosmically amazing. And, it, it, you know, he's one of those guys where if he's on a book, I'm buying that book. We talked to him uh, some time ago about his book, Bloodstained Teeth, which he did with Patrick Reynolds, which was another series that we really, really enjoyed. But there's something extra special about having a book that is written and illustrated by Christian Ward. Yes. As he says in our conversation with us, this is a book that he really treated like an independent uh, publication and DC Comics really had very little input or tinkering with it so it feels like something you would see over at Image or Dark Horse or Oni or self-published it's extremely representative of the way that Christian's mind works yeah. and the way that he has been kind of living with Batman for his entire, you know, growing up years, yeah. coming of ageness. And Christian is so into what we do here at Comic Book Couples Counseling. So he's very comfortable getting vulnerable and open with us. And... But he's also really frightened that we don't make it sound punchy and kicky enough. <laughs> there is punching and kicking. There is horror stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go to our website, we're going to have a little preview of this conversation you can get a little chunk of the transcript and take a look at it to just hype you up for next week uh, but foc on that comic is this sunday so make sure you call up your comic book store and get it subscribed you're not going to want to miss out on city of madness our september is already jam-packed we have some amazing interviews in the can just sitting there 
hot and fresh, ready for you. Well, not ready for you. We have to do the intros and outros. First, <laughs> <laughs> we have an interview with Dave Chisholm on Miles Davis and the Search for the Sound, a beautiful graphic novel. Then we have an interview about the first issue of Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees by Patrick Hovarth, which is also brilliant. And we just put out a review of that on Comic Book Couples Counseling. Because the goodness of that book is an emergency. Absolutely. And FOC is also this Sunday for that comic too. We also have an interview with David Dasmalchin about Count Crowley, which I, I really cherish that conversation. And we have Chris and Laura Somney back for the return of the ultimate Jana and the Unpossible Monsters interview. So this is kind of like in the style of our Dan Slot Silver Surfer chat or Daniel Warren Johnson, our chat about do a powerbomb. Yeah. It's full spoilers. Yeah. We really get into the nitty gritty of the book. John so on October 31st is going to get its big deluxe hardcover edition. And this tome is gorgeous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, besides all those amazing episodes that we're going to be bringing to you in September and October, we are going to be at Baltimore Comic Con, or actually, Brad's going to be at Baltimore Comic Con because Lisa has to work. I'm Boo. singing a wedding. Somebody's special day is on my special day. But one of our really rad patrons and comic book creators, Drew Edwards, invited us to moderate a couple of his panels at Baltimore. The first one is the Psyche of Superheroes. That's on Saturday, September 9th at 11 a.m. And it'll go to 11.45 in room 338. And then also on Saturday, I'll be moderating the panel, Bring on the Bad Guys at 3 o'clock to 3.45, and that is in room 338. After Baltimore, Lisa and I are going to get on a plane, and we are going to travel to Austin, Texas, and go to Fantastic Fest, the film festival. Already we're scheduling some really interesting interviews there. Not ready to announce just yet, but excited that the trans Joker story, the people's Joker is yes. going to be playing there. And that's like my number one priority. And then after that, Macon Blair's Toxic Avenger. I can't believe we're getting a new Toxic Avenger movie with Peter Dinklage of all people. And then after Fantastic Fest, we are going to New York City and we're going to have a couple panels at New York City Comic Con. That's nuts! Brad and I are both screaming Brad because he's excited. Lisa, because she is entirely overwhelmed. <laughs> you're just stuck and you need to get unstuck, Lisa. And you're going to be because you're going to be super excited because on Saturday, October 14th at 10.45 a.m. in room 406.2, we are going to be moderating. Get this, friends. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the next mutation of Turtle Power from IDW Publishing, which will have folks like Kevin Eastman on it, a special surprise guest who we know who it is. Because we're you're moderating gonna... the panel. I just said that. I know, but it's exciting. Okay, okay. And if that wasn't enough, on the same day at six o'clock in the River Pavilion, we'll be on the awesome power of comic book podcasts and how you can start one yourself panel with our buddies Chris Hacker from the Oblivion Bar, Botter from the Short Box Podcast, and a bunch of other really rad comic book podcast people. So yeah, you, if you're in New York, you got to go to New York Comic Con that weekend. Please come to our panels. Uh, this is a huge moment for comic book couples counseling. And that's really thanks to you guys, the listeners. We really appreciate you. We love having you here in the love nest with us. We also want to thank Omnibus for really believing in us and sponsoring our new segment, the referrals. We think they really are going to add to our mission of just sharing more comics. Yeah. And again, head on over to Omnibus. Find the link in the show notes. Explore their comic book store. You're going to find some rad books there beyond just the two that we referred this week. Okay, Brad, it's getting quitting time and you're corporeal and I'm corporeal <laughs> and we both have a passionate hour to kill. I can't believe I can just recycle my Dr. Mirage copy. <laughs> 
for this segue. <laughs> Love it. Where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? You can find me on most social medias at Mouthdork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show posters, send them to Karen Charm at Karen underscore X-Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I am always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Spotify, YouTube, Google, Apple Podcasts, or whatever app you prefer. We're everywhere. If you'd like to get exclusive, you can join our Patreon, where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. Including our new Married to Single series, which we launched with Daniel Warren Johnson talking about one of his favorite single issue comics, The Nom Number 9. Jason Ayers will be our next guest talking about Uncanny X-Men number 183. And guess what? Christian Ward will be guest number three, talking about Arkham Asylum, the original graphic novel. And if you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on our socials, all of them, at CBCC Podcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to do an active service, why not rate a review of the show while you're there? Yes, please. We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So until next time, friends, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. See, I want to bring big energy because this is like our 200th episode. I need to sound excited. Yeah, I'm I'm all for big energy. I don't know why you're saying it as if before I just hit record, it's I was like, that, tamper it down, lady. No, it's just like, but when I bring big energy, I tend to rush and then I feel my taste. Okay, okay. When so you I want to bring, bring big energy slow the energy only, <laughs> the only time i'm concerned about your big energy is when you blow out the mic which i will do yeah you'll do it many times over the course of this episode and i'm okay with that i've come to terms with it over five years almost five years <laughs> i'm i refuse to get better uh, i know <laughs> You are now in session with the Comic Book Couples Counseling Podcast. I'm Lisa Gullickson. I'm Brad Gullickson. And each month we evaluate a different iconic romance within the four-color realm. In this episode, we're slurping slushies, or is it slushing slurpees, and haunting the streets of the Windy City with Leon and Cody. And light carries on by Green 18 from Dark Horse Comics. First take was better. It was. Let me do it again. Referral.